All right, so I already brought you the video about Threadripper's uh, amazing 720 watts plus what? 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 What are you saying, Jay? Uh, power draw on the CPU went overclocked just with PBO. I promise you guys I'll be doing a water cooled build to see if I can get these sort of temperatures tamed. And I think today even Steve's doing liquid nitrogen on a Pro Series CPU. So not on the Threadripper desktop, but he's doing Pro Series. Um, the 96 core, 100 and whatever it is, that times two is on threads, um, CPU. So today we're just gonna stay down here in little pleb land with our $5,000 CPU while Steve's playing with his $12,000 one. The new MD7 full tower PC case from Fantex creates the perfect picture frame to show off your system. Insane airflow and direct GPU cooling creates the best possible environment for modern high power GPUs, while the internal and external cable management systems make building and maintaining your system extremely user friendly. The integrated DRGB lighting is controlled by an included dual channel DRGB controller with all new effects, allowing you to make your system uniquely yours. To see the full spec list and options, follow the link in the description below. So if you want to remember who's the real viewers YouTuber here in terms of, you know, affordability and real being real here, we're keeping it real with our little $5,000 CPU. You know, Steve's too elite now at the $12,000 level. Anyway, moving on, um, I've kind of got it loaded up here. I put everything back to stock. So a recap from the previous video, and I'm going to do it again so you guys can see. Fun fact too, we actually gained score since the weekend. <laughs> Ironically, we had a 93,900, I think, in some change. Uh, I think that's just because we had been doing lots of testing and, and stuff, and so the motherboard and the coolant was nice and saturated with heat, which obviously is gonna affect some of our all-core stuff. But as always, when you're starting a new A-B test, you have to get a new A or baseline. Why isn't B the baseline? Whatever, I digress. Um, okay, so everything is stock right here. You're gonna notice we have our CCD zero through seven. So there's a total of eight CCDs. Um, what we're looking for here is our PPT. So this is the amount of power available to our CPU package. CPU power is a different metric. I'm not sure what exactly CPU, CPU power is versus PPT. What we care about here is our limit of 95C, and then we have our uh, peak speed, which is gonna be basically an average of like all the cores. So you'll notice some of the CCXs will go up higher than others. And some of the cores within the CCX might even do different temperatures than others. And that's because each CCX has preferred cores. Uh, so it might've identified, so if we look at like CCD zero here, you can see core two is our preferred core. And then core one is our next best core. So that's what the star versus the circle is. So if we look over here, we've got C14 or core 14 and core 10 are preferred and second preferred. So you'll notice that those two cores are probably going to go higher. At least one of the star will go higher than the rest. And that's just getting you as much performance by letting one core do more because it has better ASIC quality and, and lottery, silicon lottery, if you will. So that exists on all eight of the CCDs. We are still using our Kraken Elite 360, which as we've already showed you in the past, is not the best solution for Threadripper because of the die size or the IHS size or the internal heat or integrated heat spreader versus the coverage area of the round Asetek cooler. Uh, if, you don't, if you're not sure what the layout is on Threadripper, in the very center is what's called an IO die. That's what handles all of the memory controller and the infinity fabric controller between connecting all the CCDs to each other. So that's like the central hub for all the interconnect to happen. All of the CCDs are arranged around that. So the farther away from center you get, uh, that's where the dyes are. And if you're not getting full coverage on the IHS there, then you're not efficiently cooling as well as you could because any IHS not being touched by the thermal interface material or the cooler is just heat being lost to atmosphere, which is a very slow, terrible, terrible heat transfer uh, rate. I'm actually surprised, if you wanna know the truth, at how well the uh, Asetek based cooler, I'm saying Asetek based even though it's a Kraken because it is an Asetek pump design. So it would be the same as anyone else using an Asetek rebrand uh, in terms of its cooling capability. The LCD screen on the, on top and all that, that's all NZXT, but the cooling factor is Asetek. So let's go ahead and do this again so we can see how well it's performing just with the standard 360 AIO off the shelf. And here we go. So our last one you can see here was a 95261, which is weird. <laughs> still a crazy number to think, 95,261 points. I think the uh, 96 core one with LN2, Steve's gonna break 150, 160,000, somewhere around there. So as you can see, our cores are bumping up to four and a half gigs on CCX0. We were only at like 3.9 on CCX uh, or CCD1. CCD0 was like 4.05. So they're all gonna kind of go to wherever, but that was a, a 95,387. So when we do a single test like that, a single run, we're testing spike temperature. 
that is the bottom temperature you're gonna reach. And what I mean by that is our liquid temp right now is sitting at 26 C. It actually came up one degree with that short run. And that's because of the amount of wattage being dumped into this loop. If I go ahead and, go ahead and run this again, you'll see up here um, the PPT of 350 watts is 100%. So we're hitting 350 watt PPT with 273 watts or so of CPU power, getting dumped right into that little bitty cooler with a very low volume of coolant. So that's why you'll see the coolant stuff start to rise fairly quickly. I'm now gonna do a throttle test uh, for 10 minutes. And what will happen is as the coolant temperature goes up, the clock speed will start to come down because the coolant te temperature and the CPU temperature go up one to one. Fortunately, we're only hitting, according to Ryzen Master, we're only hitting 62.8, 63, uh, just under 64 degrees Celsius. That almost seems too good to be true. But as you can see, we've already risen another degree on the liquid temp. So now we're up to 28 degrees on the liquid temp. So that will continue to go up. Um, quite high actually, I'll see it get as high as almost 40 degrees under this looping load. So if we go up 12 more degrees, you would see the CPU also go up 12 more degrees. It's, it's a one to one ratio like that. So there's 29 degrees. So you see how fast it's going up, it's crazy. It's going up as fast as if I had a custom loop with, with a graphics card in there because we're essentially pulling graphics card power, 40 series graphics card power through the CPU now, which is nuts. Um, but anyway, that last run was a score of 94,849. So you'll notice over time, it'll start to step down, down, down because it's adjusting its clock speeds based on the temperatures. Now the temperatures aren't bad, obviously, 65.8, 66.7, 67.4, So you see they are starting to kind of go up as we dump a lot of heat into a small volume. Now it's at 30. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna let the test run as it gets towards the end of the 10 minute loop, we're gonna see what our max temperature sort of reached out at or, or capped out at, and then we'll compare that to our custom loop. Unfortunately, my custom loop does not have a temperature sensor in it, so I will not be able to tell you what the fluid temp is, but we'll be able to get a pretty good idea based on what the overall temps look like. Um, when we're done with this, we are going to go back to PBO on, which is where we will hit 95C instantly, and we will see the clock speeds drop down to like 3.7, or 4.0, depending on the, the CCD, nearly instantly, but we will get a higher score. The question is, can we get that higher score to continue to be higher than we are, where we are now with lower wattage and lower overall throttling? That's what we're looking at. It's gonna throttle, no matter what. We just need to make the throttle reason not be temperature. So after 10 minutes, our coolant kind of normalized at 33C. Um, it's funny, we took the FLIR camera and we looked at the radiator and we found that the hot side of the rad was about 38 degrees in terms of coolant going into the radiator coming out of the CPU and about 27 and a half to 28 degrees coming out of the radiator, which means that this is a pretty accurate liquid temp sensor at the pump because of the fact that 33 is in the middle. <laughs> so that was, hey, there you go. A little collaboration there in, of temps to say it's accurate enough to be able to see what the fluid temps are. We also took the FLIR camera while this was running and tested uh, the corners of the CPU are actually exposed. You can see the corners of the IHS sticking out wider than the cooler. Ironically, they weren't really that warm. So that tells us that enough of the heat is being absorbed through the pump that it's probably drawing some of that heat through the metal, I guess. Um, or maybe there's just not a lot of heat making it to the outsides. So we're gonna find out now when we do the full cover block that touches the entire IHS, if any, if there's any improvement there, or if we're gonna just see improvement through the thermal mass of the much thicker, much heavier copper metal that's gonna be on top of the, the CPU. We're not gonna really be able to see if it's any better because we won't be able to see the corner once the full cover block is on. Also too, the VRMs, according to our thermal uh, camera here, I noticed the fans were not turning on during this test. Uh, the VRMs are only showing like 40C at the most, at least what we could see on the side of the cooler. The cooler heat sink on top was about 40C, so that makes, makes sense that the fans aren't turned on. But obviously when we overclock, I have a no doubt those fans are gonna turn on. If they're not, we can go in and customize that in the BIOS as well. Um, the other thing I wanted to sort of point out too was that when we were pointing the FLIR at the corner of the CPU, um, it was only at like 3840C on the corner of the CPU IHS, but what was actually glowing pretty hot was the frame. So remember you have the contact frame which folds down on the Threadripper CPU and then you torque down the, the, the three screws. That frame was actually really, really hot. So it shows that that was absorbing a lot of heat which clearly isn't touching the cooler. 
Um, it's not gonna matter either with the full cover block, but I just thought it was interesting to see what was glowing was the frame. I was not expecting that. So kind of, it's nice to be, I'm gonna get a better FLIR camera than the one that attaches to the phone only so I can have a higher def image to really start looking at this sort of stuff. Cause sometimes what you think is happening is not what's happening at all. Now, obviously we have to overclock it because I, I think I just kind of showed there's really no reason to do a custom water cooling loop with Threadripper, um, especially. So the 7980X is the highest HPDT or high performance desktop um, CPU, unless you go into the pro lineup, which you probably wouldn't want to do a custom water loop anyway at that point, because you need ultra serviceability if it's a workstation or a server or something like that. So, um, but if you're going to be overclocking, obviously you're going to be dealing with a lot of thermal. So if you're an at-home user and enthusiast, obviously I think custom water cooling would be the best performance option for you if you're even considering overclocking. Now with PBO enabled, it has allowed our max CPU speed up to 5.6 gigahertz, from 5.1 to 5.6. That's 500 megahertz on the single core. Now, only one core is gonna hit that. I'm gonna start my test right now with single core because I wanna see if we even get close to that. So, 5.3, 5.3, wow. Yeah, it's actually going 5.3 right here on CCD3. That core right there is doing 5.3. Now we're not getting the 5.6 because of many reasons. There's a lot of different factors here that could be accounting for that. But what I want to point out right now is that uh, you see our limits have all risen. So our PPT instead of 350 watts is now 2000 watts, effectively just a an uncap. But anyway, I'm gonna stop the single core because I really don't care about that. I care about multi-core. If we watch our temperature right here, it's gonna go 95 instantly. But what I care about is what our clock speed starts at and drops down to, because that's what we need to compare before and after. What we're hoping to get out of the better thermal solution is that that clock speed will stay higher longer. That's what we need. So multi-core test. So there's four, seven, four, eight, all core, four, six. Now we hit 95, there's a 111,071. Because the coolant temp is so cold right now, you'll notice it took a little bit longer to hit 95C than when we did our review the other day because of the fact that we had been running it for hours and hours and hours, so it was nice and saturated. I'm gonna let the system cool down right now, and then we are going to just go for it. I've got two 360 rads I'm gonna put in here. I might do two 420s. I think I have two 420 rads, which would be better than 360, uh, 360 to be honest, it's more surface area. Um, if I do, I'll throw those in there, put my reservoir in, and we're doing soft tubing because we want to be able to take this cooler off and throw in our other CPU and mess around with it. So rigid tubing would look nicer, soft tubing is better for serviceability, um, and we'll see exactly how much we, I guess, drop our temperatures. Let me show you the block we're using though. So the block we're using here is the EK Quantum Magnitude. The Magnitude's actually their highest rated block, like their highest tier block. Um, I'm hoping that with its integrated, like really, awesome design internal channel we'll be able to get really good performance out of it but as you can see this is a this is a chunker this is a chunker of a cpu block but look at the size of the actual rear it's the size of this thing is intended for threadripper so we should get really good full coverage with that the rgb is just a bonus it won't even be plugged in because this motherboard which is a workstation board has no rgb ports anywhere on it so this will be a wire that's just dangling doing nothing that's fine and then our mounting mechanism is pretty damn simple it just Threads right down on the existing core mount system that's there for Threadripper. So hopefully this will be enough thermal mass, like just the thickness of this block to be able to absorb more heat. I think that's our limiting factor, honestly, with the, the, the crack in here is not just the fact that it doesn't touch a whole IHS. It's also the fact that it's such a thin copper plate. We've even taken them apart and shown you how thin they are. Um, this is just much more th thermal density.
NZXT's Build is a quick and easy way to get a new gaming computer. Build a gaming PC on your budget using the built-in configurator and see exactly how your favorite games will perform. Don't want to spec it yourself? Then choose from BLD's pre-configured player PC systems designed to fit your needs and budget. To see the full lineup and specs of the NZXT BLD Player Series pre-built PCs, follow the sponsored link in the description below. And through the magic of editing, we are now custom water-cooled. Uh, so I did end up going with two 420 millimeter rads. I was kind of conflicted on this because I do have thin 360s, fat 360s, and thin 420s. I decided to go with the thin 420 because I wanted to get the overall bigger surface area with better airflow. So hopefully that works out okay. As you can see, our RGB stuff is not working on it because there are no RGB headers on this uh, Pro Sage motherboard because it's a pro to your product. And I don't have a GST to a backwards JST from three pin to JST to plug into the control box. It doesn't matter. It's a workstation product. It's also soft tubing, just kind of going everywhere willy nilly because it doesn't matter. It's about being able to just water cool the system and still be able to service it if we need. I also dyed the fluid and my fingers a lovely shade of blue. So that way you guys could see the fluid during the vacuum fill, so it looked kind of neat. With that said, I can tell you, even though I cannot see the fluid temperatures, I can tell you everything is overall cooler already. Our CPU is sitting at 33 degrees ASUS units, because we don't know exactly which temperature it uses for the motherboard. But I can tell you, looking at the Ryzen Master, we are at, well, 34 degrees. And that says 33, now it says 32, and that says 34. So they're pretty damn good. We're back to stock settings with the 350 watt limitation on there. And I wanna see what our temperatures look like now with just a single run what they're gonna spike at. Remember last time they hit like what, 60 something? 41, 42, 42.51 degrees with a 91,982. So, oh, that's because I forgot to stop all the other stuff that's running. So you'd be surprised how much background tasks can actually affect your score. And I guess, oops, I can show you this in real time, how much OneDrive and NVIDIA control panel and Defender actually affect your score. Cause I'm like, that score is not right. Uh, Okay, with that said, let's go again. Shut up. 45.7, 40 degrees, 42. CPU power is at 239, it's a little lower because remember, heat does convert to watts, etc. There's a 93,367. So weirdly enough, it's a little lower than where we started, but this particular test, it, it's over so quick, it's hard for it to fully load the CPUs long enough to get an accurate score. So anywhere between like the 93,000 that we just got, 93,300 and some change, which matches our original review. Although today, because it, everything was so much cooler when we came in, it was a 95,000. Um, this is still landing exactly where we were before. Look, Steve's thumbnail said, insane efficiency, and it's true. How in the hell can, can 64 cores and 128 working threads at about four gigahertz all core overclock stay 45C under load? I am so optimistic right now about turning on PBO. So with that said, we are now gonna go back into creator mode and we are gonna turn on precision boost overdrive. And we might stay under 95, <laughs> maybe. We'll see, that's a lot of watts. All right, so P Precision Boost Overdrive is now enabled after a couple of restarts and retrainings and I don't know, 15 minutes later, because AMD, unfortunately. Um, one thing I wanna point out, you'll notice on the screen, all those cores that say sleep. And this was something I forgot to mention in my review, actually. It's awesome that even when Precision Boost is overdrive, or, or Precision Boost Overdrive is active and all these overclocking features, it still allows everything to go into its sleep state. So it's not gonna be sitting there pumping tons of voltage and leaving the cores awake and being super inefficient for no reason whatsoever. It will still default back to all its power saving modes while also having its overclocking modes uh, enabled. So now we can see we got our up to 2000 watts PPT, our CPU power and everything has all its super amp stuff now set. I just wanna do one run and see what the temperatures spike at. I'm optimistic here. 64, 71. 75 at 4.8 gigahertz, 79, 48 all core, 115,265. So as you can see right here, it clearly scales with temperature very well. We feel like this is the first time PBO actually does something meaningful and tangible. So from a 93 slash 95 up to a 115,000, damn, we're 12,000 point increase by just increase, improving our cooling. 
So let's go ahead and just let it loop right now. 681 <laughs> consistent watt draw on the CPU. 691, 685. Oh man, it makes me want to go in there and try and like go even higher. So we are getting 4.8 all core on every CCD. That was not the case with the AIO. We had one CCD zero giving us the best and then everything else was below that. We are getting 4.8 across the board. The SOC is currently at 1.2 volts. So one of the things AMD recommends is if you get a stable overclock is to then go in and lower the SOC voltage a little bit because it's not necessary uh, to, to have it maxed out and that can save some unnecessary heat. But right now we're at 83.84, 84. 84.8. Like I have 10C available headroom to me. The last run was still 115.371. So we're not losing score, although it's hitting 97 now because the fluid is starting to, like there's warmth coming out of there. <laughs> All right, so we're starting to approach 90C, 87, 88, 89, 90, 89.6. So it dropped down to three or 4.75. So you can see right there, 4.75 from 4.8. So our score is gonna be down a little bit. Yeah, 114.903. And that's with it just running nonstop, attempting 4.8 all core. Um, Dude, this magnitude block. So this is a TRX4, a TR, TRX40 block for previous generation Threadripper. But fortunately, because they use all the same so socket layout and stuff, uh, even though the pins might be different, the actual mechanism to retain, retain the block is the same. I was able to just take a previous gen block, put it on there. Uh, and as you can see, getting, that, that, there's 90C right there. What we're dealing with right now is the fluid is starting to go up. Now, as the fluid gets hotter and the CPU gets warmer, I have it set so that at 90C, our fans start blowing 100%. And I can feel now that they're actually blowing 100%. So a little bit of a realization, I, I did have 100% fan speed already going for the fans. So I decided to go ahead and give you some other piece of information here. I have dropped down the SOC voltage as recommended by AMD, like I said. So we 1.2 volts was the stock SOC voltage, which as you saw was pulling almost 80 watts for SOC. Remember that's, that's just controller voltage, right? So it's now dropped down significantly. So we're at 1.15 volts. And I wanna see what this does overall to our temperature because any wattage we drop there is gonna drop it from the package wattage, which will drop it overall temperature. And AMD specifically said you can get rid of excess heat that's unnecessary by dropping the SOC voltage. So let's just do a single run right here. And all I care about right here is what's gonna happen with my SOC power voltage right here. Okay, 63 watts. So we've come from 79 watts or so down to 64 watts at 1.15. 115,752. That's technically our fastest score yet. Now, if I wanted to keep going with some overclocking tutorial or whatever with Threadripper, I'd have to continue to drop that SOC voltage to where we're no longer stable. The problem is it takes a freaking while every time you reboot. I don't have that much time today. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna continue to screw around with Threadripper. It has been a while since we've messed around with this, especially when it comes to overclocking, because I'll be honest with you, overclocking Threadripper in the past has been a crapshoot. Typically, there was very little headroom, definitely very poor memory stability issues, uh, and so, now that this is running on the 7000 series chiplet cores, essentially they're just a bunch of 7950Xs thrown in there, and it has the stability of DDR5 and Expo RAM and all that, I feel like I can go through here and really kind of get familiar with the nuances and then put out an actual Threadripper overclocking guide for all seven people that might buy it in the world. So, I don't know, maybe 7D people will buy it, 7-0, I don't know. But it might still be worth doing. But we did pick up score, 115,752. Now I'll look at what the actual temperature was because I didn't pay attention to that. Probably won't change much at all. 72, 76, 77. 78. Okay, so it did. <laughs> so it went from like 8081 down to 77. So obviously there's a 116091 <laughs> if we continue to gain score. So I'm gonna do a run without Ryzen Master going because I forgot Ryzen Master tends to eat up some performance because it, as it pulls the CPU for temps and everything that's going on, it has to kind of stop a process for just a microsecond to be able to respond to the polling software, which is Ryzen Master in this instance. So we had a 1169 something. It like visibly even looks faster. This is so stupid. So 119.535. Okay, getting to 120,000 will be super, super easy. Um, anyway, so yeah, there you go. Uh, we'll play around with this and I think it'd be fun now to just 
chill the inside of this with the air conditioner or something. And the temperature, like the last time I let it cool down for a minute here before we did this run, I saw 75 C as the max temp while it was running. So anyway, all right guys, thanks for watching. And uh, actually I just wanna point this out, this entire week right now, we got a stupid like up to 30% off sale happening at the j2sense.com merch store. Um, so we got a huge sale on gaming mats. There's like this exact one right here, dad bod shirts, and we got the new melting connector shirt coming. You covered it with the chair. <laughs> and then we got our new shirt design right here, which is, you know, of course, paying homage to uh, one of the worst oversights in design philosophy ever in the PC industry, the J2 Sense melting 12 volt high power connector. And this is also going to debut at 15% off. You guys are going to want that for either yourself or a nerd in your family who maybe knows of the channel. Or has one of those.